So, for those of you who didn't know, uh, today is Grandparents' Day. Uh, I'm assuming that Grandparents' Day moves around kind of the way that like Mother's Day and Father's Day move around. Um, same thing with like Sisters and Brothers' Day. It's like, well, we're going to have them land on a Sunday every year. Okay. Uh, so this year it landed on uh, September 12th. Uh, is Grandparents Day and I'm doing another one of the uh, you know kind of family based one piece videos where I go over some of the different uh, family in one piece. Um, of course I've done Mother's Day, Father's Day, Brother's Day, and Sister's Day and now this is Grandparents Day. Um, so I'll be going over the different uh, grandparent characters or grandparent type characters to a degree that are in one piece. Um, and <laughs> so let's just kind of uh, start with the beginning. Um, so, you know, I always start with, like, the ones that are connected to the Straw Hats first, and, of course, top of the, uh, the top of the top of the top of that list is, of course, Monkey D. Garp, the Fist, Hero of the Marines, uh, grandfather of Luffy, well, biological grandfather of Luffy, adopted grandfather of Ace, and I don't remember if we ever find out if Garp ever actually meets Sabo. I think he does, given the amount of time that, like, Sabo is like around Luffy and Ace. I think at some point Garp does meet Sabo when they're still kids. Um, you know, before everything happens with Sabo. So I guess he kind of qualifies as a little bit of like a surrogate grandfather to um, Sabo. Also the fact that like Sabo was kind of like raised by Dragon. So there's that connection there. Um, don't know, you know, in regards to that, we don't know like if, if Garp did know anything about like Sabo, if like, I, I, we don't know how he reacted to, like, when Sabo, quote-unquote, died way back when they were kids, or even now, we don't know, um, in regards to what Garp would think of Sabo. I guess we might find that out down the line, but I don't know. So, first we'll start with, uh, just kind of, uh, Garp's relationship with Luffy, um, because, of course, you know, he, of course, kind of raised Luffy to a degree, um, uh, he kind of also, like, raised, uh, Ace to a degree as well, like, when they were, like, little babies, he probably took care of them until he decided that they were, you're old enough to fend for yourselves, I gotta go back to being a Marine and being the fist and punching things, and Sengoku has paperwork I have to go do, um, <laughs> or else he's gonna get angry at me and beat me with his Buddha giant, giant Buddha, um, <laughs> And, like, he, you know, he left Luffy to be raised kind of by the townsfolk, and he left Ace to be raised by the Don, until he took Luffy there as well. Um, we also see lots of similarities between the two of them, uh, even kind of between the three of them, given the fact that all three of them kind of seem to have a little bit of narcolepsy, um, given the fact that, like, you know, when we first see Garp and Luffy interact, you know, first he's, like, yelling at Luffy and telling him off or something, and then they both, like, fall asleep at the same time. <sighs> and, you know, they you know, so they're very similar to a degree. Um, Ace kind of does the same thing a little bit, you know, when we first meet him at Alabaster, the first thing he does is like, oh my god, he ate something poisonous, he's dead! No, he just fell asleep. Um, it's like, oh, no, I, I'm fine, I just fell asleep, I'm back to eating food. Um, of course, you know, our introduction to Ace. Um, and, you know, we don't really, the main interaction we see, of course, between Ace and Garp is, of course, when Ace is locked up and impel down and Garp comes to visit him and tries to talk to him. I, I'm assuming Garp is, like, maybe trying, like, one last-ditch effort to try to get Ace to do something to try to do something to save Ace's life, and of course when they're on the, the scaffolding when Ace is going to be um, executed at Marine Ford, which I will go over. Um, first I kind of wanted to go over a little bit more of the, um, the past that we see between Garp and Luffy and Ace. So, of course when we get Luffy's flashback about, you know, after Ace become a gummin on me and when he's taken to go live with Dawn, Garp just like drags him there. <laughs> it's like, nope, you're gonna go live with the Dawn and the jungle and the mountains and the mountain bandits but i don't like mountain bandits they're bad and he's like screw that and he just like dragging luffy there of course and he uses his fists of love a lot you know garp of course always likes to use his uh, fists of love on luffy and i apologize if i sound snuff uh stuffed up at the moment allergy there's a lot of allergens in the air and they're kind of messing with my allergies so if i sound stuffed up i apologize um or if there are a lot of cuts it probably means that i sneezed um, <laughs> um, 
And what ends up happening is, of course, you know, the way that both Luffy and Ace came to be with Garp, and I went over this in the Mother's Day and the Father's Day videos, is, of course, you know, Dragon, like, either just, like, brought Luffy to Fusha Village or, like, tracked down wherever Garp was and just, like, gave him to Garp. And was like, here, Dad, I had this kid. I gotta go run this revolutionary army. Take this kid. I'll be back in, I don't know. I'll, I don't know. Just His name's Luffy. I gotta go. And, like, Garp's just like, why do people keep leaving me with their dang kids? And then, of course, like, you know, several years earlier, when, of course, Goldie Roger is going to be, um, you know, executed, Garp, you know, Roger tells Garp, hey, I'm going to have a kid. And you and I both know that a parent, that a child should not be blamed for the sins of their father or for the sins of their parents. And, of course, Garp agrees with this. And, like, he tells Garp where Rouge is. And then Garp, of course, goes and he finds Rouge and you know gets to her you know probably just a couple of days or you know within a day or two of like when she gives birth um and you know she gives birth to ace and she names him and then she gives him to garp and then unfortunately she dies and garp takes ace and raises him and you know names him you know still calls him you know gold d ace but i'm like just don't do that just call him like monkey d ace or something like that to kind of protect him you know, at least running around with your last name would be better than running around with the P King of the Pirates' last name in regards to Ace's self-esteem for a while. And then when he's older, you can explain to him that, okay, no, I'm not your biological grandfather, and you and Luffy do not share the same dad. Your father is Gold D. Roger, and your mother was Porkis D. Rouge, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, that may have helped with some of Ace's issues, but, you know, Garp doesn't think that far ahead, I don't think. Um... And, of course, what ends up happening is, you know, Garp raises Ace, raises Ace and loves him just as much as he loves Luffy, uh, just as much as he loves Luffy. That is not in any form of argument, because we see how much he loves Ace and how much he loves Luffy, and that he wanted them both to grow up to become great Marines like him, partially because he wanted to know that they were safe, because if they become pirates and they're out there and they're wanted and they have bounty posters... And he can't really do that much to protect them. But if they became Marines, he would be able to protect them. And that would just be something that would make... That would, like, probably lower Garp's stress level. Because it's like, okay, they're Marines. At least I'm able to track them down and know where they are most times. Oh my god, where did they go? <laughs> it's like, they would still be, like, off going and doing whatever the frick they wanted to do. But, you know, he would at least be able to have some form of protection over them to protect them from, you know, being tracked down by the warlords or being tracked down by the admirals or whatever the case would be. And, yeah, there's a lot of fan fiction out there where, like, oh, Luffy became, like, a marine, like, the way Garp wanted to. And, or, like, even, like, Ace and Luffy both came, became marines. Or I've seen fan fictions or, like, fan art that's like, Luffy, Ace, and Sabo all became marines. And it's like, Luffy and Aokiji get along great. And, like, Sabo and, um, uh, Kizaru, uh, get along fine. And then, like, Ace and, um, Akainu, like, butt heads. And, like, Garp's just in the background going, like, oh my god, my life, help. Um, <laughs> like, the, like, oh my god. And, like, the three, you know, like, Garp's dream would have been to see the three you know, his three grandsons, you know, Sabo included in that, all grow up to be, like, the next, the next admirals and such like that. You know, that would have been his dream. And the thing is, is that on that, if Ace had become a Marine and he just stayed as the name of, like, Porcus D. Ace or had, you know, Monkey D. Ace as his name, then, and, like, even if Sabo took up that name, then that would be, you know, I guess more monkeys to cause anarchy in the government later, I guess, but... Um, you know, it would, you know, it would keep Ace safer because it's like, it's like if, if like Sengoku did find out about Ace's parentage, about who his real father was, then Garp could have simply just pointed out like, well, okay, yeah, I, I, you know, uh, uh, Sengoku, I get it, I get it, I get it, I understand where you're coming from. But look, Ace is, you know, he's like this, like, you know, maybe a vice admiral or something like that, or like a, whatever Ace had gotten up to in the Marines at that point in time. He's like that, and he's like training, and he's being good, and he's not doing anything wrong, for the most part. And, you know, a you know, Sabo and Luffy are the same way, they're all training, they're all really strong and powerful and everything. 
Like, don't tell the sin. Don't tell anyone else that you found out about this. Just like burn that evidence because he's not his father. And Sengoku might have agreed with that and even like, okay, fine, Garp. I won't do that. I won't tell everyone who his father is. Fine. Because it was like Ace wasn't a pirate at that point in time, so they wouldn't have necessarily had a reason to go and find any more information about him. Um, or they would have just taken it at Garp's word to a degree. I'm pretty sure that Sengoku and Suwu probably would have found out because they were like Garp's best friends. Um, and Garp may have told them. But for the most part, I don't think there would have been too much with that. Flip side of that, flip side, is that um, it would, you know, we know about S.W.O.R.D. at this point in time, of course. And we know that like Drake and Kobe are part of S.W.O.R.D. They're a series that, of course, that like Garp's part of S.W.O.R.D. and Sengoku and, you know, Helmeppo and, you know... Are, you know, Kuzan are, like, all part of S.W.O.R.D. And, like, you know, you know, Drake's undercover, but he's, like, cover's kind of been blown, and he's, like, helping the Straw Hats right now, and, like, Kobe's off to go do something. And, you know, we have this theory of, like, who's in S.W.O.R.D., and, you know, like, maybe, like, um, uh, Fujitora might be in S.W.O.R.D. as well. Um, but, you know, if that was the case, and if Garp was part of S.W.O.R.D., then he probably would have just made Luffy, Sabo, and Ace all part of S.W.O.R.D um when that came about and just like made them all part of sword and then either had played up on the fact that oh they're d's so they like to cause anarchy and either like have it be that like sabo like goes off and pretends to join the revolutionary army technically kind of does agree with what they want to do because of what he saw when he was growing up so he can play on that and then like luffy maybe does go off and like becomes a pirate the same way that drake did and then, like, you know, Ace goes off and does something else. You know, he, like, plays up on the fact of, like, they're Ds. They're, you know, natural enemies of the Celestial Dragons. And that would have been, like, a fun thing to see. That'd be, like, a fun alternate reality type thing. <laughs> um, maybe that's something I can go off of. But, you know, Luffy and Ace do love their grandfather. And Garp loves the two kids. Loves both of them. And, you know... He was, you know, he, he was very proud whenever Luffy, you know, does any outrageous acts, but he's also infuriated when he finds out that Luffy broke into Impel Down to try to rescue Ace, and, you know, when he shows up at Marine Ford and everything. And he's just, you know, he's he's extremely pissed when, you know, um, <laughs> Akainu uh, kills Ace, and he's about ready to go and kill Akainu for killing Ace, even though it's basically, oh... That was kind of what was supposed to happen anyway, but, you know, it's still this whole thing of, like, Garp watched as, like, Luffy and the rest of the, you know, the Whitebeard Pirates and the, you know, the escapees from Impel Down, that, like, they fought through the Marines and fought through the Warlords and fought their way all the way up, you know, Luffy himself fought his all the way up to the, to the scaffolding to get Ace, and he saved Ace, and he got Ace, and they were gonna leave, and, like, I'm pretty sure part of Garp was just thinking... Yes, yes, just go, just go, just go, and I don't have to watch my grandson die. But of course, in that time frame, you know, you know, Garp does, you know, try to block Luffy from getting to Ace and, you know, citing his duties as a Marine. And Luffy's just like, F this, Grandpa, and then he just like punches Garp out of the way. To, and, you know, it's, you know, Garp kind of like allowed Luffy to punch him and get him out of the way, so, you know, so it could look like he was fighting back, but he really wasn't, so that way Luffy could get to Ace. And, of course, you know, Garp is just horrified when he sees what happens to Ace, when he sees Akainu kill Ace. He's he's horrified by that. And, you know, he, he then wants to go and kill Akainu, but that's not really going to work. Um, and, of course, you know, we see that, and even, you know, now, two years later in the time skip, you know, Garp, because of what happened, Garp kind of, like, retired from being a Marine. And, um... He's still, like, a trainer and everything, because we still see him being, like, a trainer with, like, Kobe and Helmepro, and he still holds the rank of Vice Admiral, but he doesn't have as many, um, as much, um, you know, as, as many, um, responsibilities as he did in the past. He's still a, probably a pretty dang good fighter, and we might still get to see him fight at some point again. Um, I mean, we've seen, like, flashes of him, like, in, in flashbacks and stuff like that with, like, you know, with the Roger flashback and everything. Um, with, like, Odin's flashback and things like that, we saw some bits in there um, that, you know, him and 
you know, Roger, you know, respected each other quite a bit. Um, and like Roger also respected Son Goku, but this is not about Son Goku. Um, although by technicality, I guess the closest thing to like a grandson that Sengoku had was kind of law, given his relationship with um, Corazon, but that can be left up for debate. Um, but of course, what ends up happening is, you know, we get, you know, after we're explained who the Dawn is and everything after Luffy's flashback and we cut back to... Um, you know, Fusha Village, we see Dadon just, like, beating on Garp. Um, you know, like, you were there. You could have stopped it. You could have saved Ace. You could have done this. You could have done more. And, you know, Makano, and I went over this in the Mother's Day video, like, Makano stops Dadon from beating on Garp, and she's like, you know, you know, if you think that you're hurting, if I think that I'm hurting, imagine how much Garp is hurting. And, of course, Dadon is like, no, the one who's hurting the most right now is Luffy. And Makano doesn't deny that. And I don't think Garp would deny that either. Um, Garp, Garp loved Ace just as much as he loved Luffy, as I said. And, like, he raised Ace. He technically kind of betrayed the, you know, he technically kind of betrayed the Marines in regards to even taking Ace in or not, like, turning Ace in as a baby and turning, you know, Rouge in. Um when Ace was born, and, you know, Garp, Garp loved the kid and, and raised him and everything just as much as he did with Luffy, and, you know, yeah, his version of, like, love and, like, whenever he would show up and, like, you know, train the kids, um, but of course, you know, Garp's brand of love, like, his, you know, fist of love brand of love is that he's just, like, Okay, whenever he would show up, Luffy and Ace would just get, like, these horrified looks on their face of, Oh no. It's Grandpa. Oh my god, what's he gonna make us do now? And, like, Garp would just, like, take them and, like, throw them into the jungle. Throw them into a desert. Throw them into wherever he could find them, Fushi, just to, like, help uh, around, like, Dawn Island, just to help make them train. Like, jumps them into the forest. Come back in two weeks. If you live, you can have cake. You know, whatever the case may be. And, like, they're just terrified of him. Not that I blame him. Not that I blame the kids. Um, of course, you know, it's like he wants to raise them to become Marines. And I'm like, maybe you could not throw them into the jungle every time you show up. That might help them not be so terrified of you. Um, you know, grandparents rules. Don't throw the kids into the jungle. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things. It's like, well, the reason that, like, you know, Garp can hit Luffy is because he has his fist of love. Garp has freaking hockey. He can hit Luffy. Even with Luffy being a paramecia and being rubber, Garp can still hit him and cause damage. Um, even when Luffy was a kid, Garp was probably using, like, hockey in order to, like, hit Luffy once he got his gummo gummo powers. Um, but, you know, Garp just, you know, wants to, you know, Garp is just, I don't know what to say with Garp. Garp is, oh, I don't know. Garp is the extreme version of, I want you, I want to be proud of you, but I don't know how to express my emotions, <laughs> type of thing. And, you know, down the line when we get to, um, you know, the end of the series, when we get to, like, the, the final battle type stuff, um, you know, the final battle between, you know, the, the, the pirates and the marines, whatever the case that turns into, or the three-way battle between, like, the marines and Luffy and the, um, you know, the Blackbeard pirates and, like, the Revolutionary Armies thrown in there somewhere. Garp might have to finally choose which side he's on. Is he gonna fight alongside his son, Dragon, and his grandson, Luffy, and try to take down the Tenryu Bito? that he's never liked in the first place, you know, is that what's going to happen? Or is it going to be something different? You know, is it going to be like, he like backs away because he like looks at Sengoku or like whatever. It's like, I can't be here because I, I, I I'm either going to fight with them or I'm not going to fight at all. Because I already watched one grandson die, and I already thought another one was dead, kind of at the hands of the Tenryu Bito in regards to Sabo. 
and I can't watch Luffy die too. And I can't prevent myself from wanting to go and stop whichever Marine, be it, you know, Akainu at that point in time or whoever else, for I can't prevent myself, I won't be able to prevent myself from going and stopping them. And helping Luffy. And helping my son. Because I've lost enough family and I don't want to lose any more. And that might just be what happens with Garp. We don't know. Um, one of the little things that we do see in the anime that this is not in the manga, and I did want to bring it up, is um, <sighs> Garp, um, in the time when like Luffy and the others are like, you know, talking about like their shared drink and everything, when they made their promises to go and become pirates, um, Garp, of course, overheard some of them boasting about that, and he gets very angry at them and starts chasing them around. And Sabo, who was there at the time, explains, oh my god, you're a monster! And, of course, you know, in the Hmong, you know, they're just doing more and more training and everything. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, he just, like, chases them around and everything. And, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes with that. Uh, the other thing I did want to talk about with Garp is we do have the, uh, the early One Piece version where we have a uh, Romance Non version 2, um, where we do see Luffy's grandfather. He's unnamed in the, uh, that chapter, but it's just, it's, you know, Oda explained later, no, that was a, an early version of Garp. Um, and this early version of Garp appears to have, it, you know, it seems to be like a former pirate. And he looks very similar to Garp and such like that, but... Um, he wasn't a Marine. He appears to be a former pirate. And he's the one in the in the Romance Dawn Part 2, or Version 2, that gave Luffy the uh, Gummo Gummo. He's the one that gave Luffy the Devil Fruit. And, you know, that's just, we get like a, a, a different version of that where we get to see kind of like something else different with Garp. Um, you know, it's like, as opposed to it being... Um, you know, as opposed to it being Shanks that inspired him, it was going to be, um, you know, Garp that inspired him. And, like, Shanks maybe would have, like, inspired him down the line, too, but it was going to be, like, Garp kind of, like, helped set that fire underneath Luffy to want to become a, the Pirate King. And, I, you know, uh, by a technicality, I mean, like, they did animate the chapter. They have, like, a, a episode on 907, I think, is... Um, a variation of uh, version two of Romance Dawn as like for one of like the, the anniversary episodes they did that. I think they also, I don't remember if they did like a, a anniversary episode or like where they did like a version of like Romance Dawn version one, but they've done those. Um, and we see, um, you know, Luffy and uh, Garp in this one seem to get along a little bit better. And Garp is of course kind of like uh, encouraging Luffy uh, if they, if Oda had gone along with that, it might have been that, like, oh, Garp had been, like, maybe not, like, a crewmate of Roger, but maybe a, um, an associate of Roger or something like that, to have, like, that connection to help, like, inspire Luffy. Um, and that would have been an interesting way of spinning it in regards to that, but, uh, we'll see what happens, uh, with that. Um, I'm sure some people have done fanfics about that, which wouldn't surprise me, so... Um, I just spent 20-some minutes talking about Garp, but let's move on to the rest of the grandparents. Um, so, the next grandparent is uh, Granny Kokoro, uh, who is Chimney's grandmother. Um, she's, you know, the closest thing to a mother that we see for Frankie and such like that, as I mentioned in the Mother's Day video. Um, she is, of course, uh, she was, uh, Granny Kokoro's uh, backstory, which I kind of went over a little bit a few times, is, you know, she left Fishman Island to support Tom when she met her husband, a human, on Water 7. Um, so her and Tom are not a couple. Uh, Chimney is not Tom's granddaughter. Uh, uh, you know, she, you know, Kokoro married her human husband, and they had a son who was half human, half fishman. And then later on, that son married and had a child, who is, of course, Chimney, who is one quarter mermaid and three-fourths human. So she's she's a hybrid. Um, I don't know if she qualifies as like the first hybrid that we meet in the series. Um, but, you know, I given the fact that like later on when we see like Big Mom and like her hybrid children, they seem to have quite a bit of uh, similarities to like, you know, their, their, their father. 
um, you know, because Praline and Prim are, of course, both half fishmen or half mermaid, and they look like they're like full mermaid. Chimney does not. She has like a similar color hair to her grandmother, but um, and we've never seen Chimney's father. He may look more fishman like um, than you know Kokoro does. Uh, you know, given the fact that she's you know older and her you know tail fin has split. Because Oda needed a reason to be able to explain why she's, you know, able to be a mermaid. Um, I went over Kokoro a fair amount during the um, Mother's Day video uh, in regards to her relationship with Frankie and with Iceberg. She is the closest thing to a mother that either of them have. Uh, still kind of is. Um, she took, you know, she took care of Chimney. Um, you know, Chimney has now grown up to be like the, uh, one of the station managers for like the, uh, the C trains on like she's like the station manager on like Sundays or something like that and she's adorable um and she of course has her little bunny cat thing um and uh Kokoro I don't necessarily know if we're gonna if we're gonna see Kokoro again I mean like we've seen her in like the cover pages when we get like a catch up with her but we don't really see too much else of her um she of course during the NS lobby arc she of course you know you know used her mermaid ability to like you know save the straw hats including chimney at that time um chimney being a hybrid she may have like the ability she doesn't have the ability to like breathe underwater i don't think but she i think maybe has like a can like hold her breath longer or has a little bit higher stamina to a degree again i don't think chimney uh, or a cooker are going to ever be major parts of the story again but you know epilogue down the line we might get like Oh yeah, Frankie went back to Water Seven, and you know he, you know, he, we show him like talking and telling stories and everything to like the, you know, the Frankie family and Iceberg and the Galley Law Company and everything, and you know, Kokoro and Chimney are there, and like you know, Chimney's grown up or whatever, and you know, Frankie, Frankie, I guess it would be like the closest thing to like an uncle maybe that Chimney has, you know, him and Iceberg, um, but. Frankie didn't really do too much interacting with Kokoro when Chimney would have been around because um, he wanted to keep that connection kind of a secret but that's what we have there um we'll see what ends up happening later on so moving on to the next grandparent we have Tangent who is of course on Long Ring Long Land um so um <laughs> I wanted to bring up Tangent because not that many people talk about Tanjin. Um, and he is a grandparent. Um, he has, at the very least, two grandchildren that we are aware of. Uh, in the anime, they do give him a third. So Tanjin, of course, he, you know, 10 years ago, or 10 years prior to the beginning of the story, um, he built these stilts out of, like, this type of special bamboo. And while he's on the stilts, they keep growing. So he has to keep wandering around the island where he lives, or the section of the island where he lives, and, you know, eating on, like, the, the, the fruit on the trees that get really, really tall. And, of course, his family that are nomads, as they, like, roam around the island, they kept moving along because they had to. And, like, they knew where Tangent was. They just couldn't really do anything to get him back um, or to get him down. And, like, he has his horse, Shelly, who's adorable. Um, and, you know, what ends up happening is... In the anime, after Luffy and the others help get him down, kind of just knock him down, um, you know, and he's fine and everything. He gets, you know, looked over by, you know, they deal with Foxy and everything, however that goes. Um, Luffy and the others watch as this giant, like, mole thing digs itself out of the ground and pops up. And on top of it is uh, uh, Rit -onto, Ritonto, uh, who is Tangent's grandson, anime only. And he has this, you know, giant mole that's his pet. And he, you know, when he was trying to dig the ground to, you know, try to get back to Tangent so he could help get his, you know, grandfather back home. Which is the way they kind of solve that in the anime. And they kind of, in the manga, it's just no, uh, Kuzan is there and he just like freezes part of the water so, you know, Tangent can walk over the water and find his way to his family. Um... Although both ways result in like Tangent being able to get back to his family and in after the time skip during uh, one of the cover page stories uh, we see Tangent with his two other grandchildren 
Um, doesn't mean that he couldn't have another grandchild. It just means that uh, he's tech, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, Rotonto is technically not canon because he's anime only. Um, but we do see Tangent with his two other uh, grandchildren. Um, and then he's very happy. We see that he got, you know, reunited with his family. Um, again, I don't think we're going to really see Tangent again. He doesn't strike me as something that we're going to see uh, again anytime soon. Um, it's not like, oh my god, what was the name of that dude that we met on that really long island before? My neighbor has apparently decided to blow, to use their leaf blower. Lots of hands. Okay, hopefully that lessens the noise if you could hear it. Um, and what ends up happening is, you know, I don't think we're ever going to see Tonjin again. But moving on, uh, the next one we have Gladiolusa, uh, or Elder Neon, or Gran Granny Neon, that is on Amazon Lily. Um, she is a former Empress of the Kuja, and she, you know, was Empress at some point before Boa Hancock took over. Um, and she is currently just referred to as Elder Neon or Grand Neon, and she always like, meow, you know, she kind of like has like cat noises and such like that. Um, she, um, as far as I'm aware, she doesn't actually have a biological relationship to the three, um, Boa sisters, but she basically does act like a grandmother to them. Uh, you know, she was with, she had, uh, left, um, Amazon Lily at some point because she had had like the love sickness so she left Amazon Lily I'm assuming to be with the man that she was in love with or something and left someone else in charge a different empress and then she ends up actually being with um Shaki and Rayleigh uh during the time frame when um the sisters have escaped from Marie and she helps kind of like get them nursed back to health and everything and she probably helps them come up with the plan of, oh, this is where when, you know, we're going to go back to Amazon Lily and the three of you just say that for the last so many years, you've been off fighting Medusa and you hide your backs because of the symbol. And what you do is you just tell everyone that you defeated Medusa, but she put like her eyes on your back. So anytime someone looks at your back, you will you know, it will turn them to stone. And you explain that, you know, that's why Hancock can turn people to stone. That's why Marigold and Tinder Sodia can, you know, change into snakes. That it's from that leftover power of Medusa. And of course, that's the what the sisters go with. And that's what they tell the Kuja. And the Kuja believe it. Um, Granny Neon is very, she very much cares for the three girls. As I mentioned, she is kind of the closest thing to a grandmother that they have. Since we've never actually seen um, the girl's mother. Um, it's not Neon, they don't have a biological relationship to her, but, uh, Sandersonia and Marigold very much seem to get along fine with Neon. It's Boa that has the, it's a uh, Hancock that has the problems with her because he's just like very annoyed at Neon and everything and like, is just like so kind of abusive to Neon and I'm just like, please stop with the elder abuse. All she wants to do is protect you and her island and, you know, Anytime that Hancock thinks that like Luffy proposed to her, or thinks that they're engaged, you know, it's like, no, that's no, you're, you're not engaged. Um, uh, we see her a bit. We of course see her in the Amazon Lily arc and we see her in the post uh, Marine Ford arc and we see her, um, uh, during like the 3D 2Y movie that we had, um, a little while ago and we see her, um, where else do we see her? We also see her um uh like just like whenever we get like a catch up on um you know kind of uh, amazon lily we see her pop up every now and then um she's also the one that explains to uh boa that oh luffy is the one that punched a celestial dragon and that's one of the things that kind of like makes you know boa a little more susceptible to like listening to luffy uh, Neon may pop up again. She might pop up and drop some lore at some point in regards to, like, the Kuja themselves. We don't really know. Uh, given the fact that she is a Kuja, she probably at least has observation and armament hockey. 
uh, given the fact that most of the Kuja seem to be able to do that. Um, I mean, Boa has Conqueror's Hockey, but, and I guess it's a possibility that maybe Neon had Conqueror's Hockey, or does, but she's just never been demonstrated to use it, um, given the fact that she was the Empress of the Island, but it might just be that Boa had it because it awakened in her because of other things that happened, because of what happened at Marie Joie that it awakened there. And uh, Neon may have not ever gone through any of that type of uh, problem uh, for the most part. She was in love at some point and she left the island to pursue that love. Um, I'm assuming that didn't ever really, that didn't go anywhere, but I could be wrong. Maybe she has like a child out there. Like maybe she had a son at some point and he's out there somewhere, but I don't know. Um, next up, we have a little more royalty. We have King Riku Dole III, who is the grandfather of Rebecca. Um, of course, you know, grandfather, granddaughter. Um, he is present at Rebecca's birth, and him and his wife and Vi uh, Violet, of course, would always uh, visit occasionally, visit, um, you know, uh, Kiros and Scarlet and little baby Rebecca, and he adored Rebecca, and he you know, was just so proud of her and so happy with her and everything. The same way he was happy with Scarlet and with Kiros and everything. And he, of course, as I mentioned, he probably, like, they probably have, like, a slight stipend or siphon or so that goes to, like, help pay um, Scarlet or something like that in regards to, like, just give them, like, enough to be able to eat and have a place to live. And then, like, she's like, and we'll cover everything else ourselves by selling the flowers. Just a little bit to help make sure that we don't starve. Because like, he does the same thing for the rest of his people when he was king. He didn't want his people to starve um, or to be, you know, homeless or so. He was a very good king and he was a very good grandfather as well. And, of course, when, um, you know, Do Flamingo showed up, when the you know, Don Quixote family shows up, um, he is, of course, devastated when he, of course, A, finds out that his daughter is dead and then B finds out that his granddaughter is probably missing. And eventually, you know, 10 years later, or so, you know, Rebecca is now a gladiator at the Coliseum because she was found and captured. And he has become a gladiator at the Coliseum as well under the name Ricky. And he probably has tried to like, once he figured out who she was, because I mean, she looks exactly like her mother. So how could you hide that? Um, he has kind of, um, more during that time frame when they're both gladiators, he's probably like kept his distance a little bit, but he's probably also like, one of us may die. I want to at least get to know my granddaughter some, and he may not tell her who he is, but like they talk, they probably talked for a while and everything like that. I hope they never really had to fight each other, but like they talked and they probably talked and bonded a little bit. And, you know, now that, you know, the, you know, now that Dressrosa is free from the Don Quixote family, um, he, you know, we see how worried he is, of course, during the, the whole battle and everything between, um, you know, when Rebecca is trying to help and everything, he watches and is worried for her because, you know, she's his granddaughter. He doesn't want to see her get hurt. He doesn't want to see Kira get her, hurt either or, you know, Violet. Um, but, you know, after everything is finished in Dressrosa, he gives her the opportunity, he gives Rebecca the opportunity of, like, your mother was princess and she was the one that was next in line to become queen until she abdicated and we faked her death because she wanted to be with your father. Um, can you know, just, you know, let them get married and then just, like, let her abdicate her throne anyway? Yeah, but at the time I wasn't thinking of it. Hey, you saw how easily I was tricked by the weird string guy with the weird fashion sense. Yeah, Grandpa, I know. Um... <laughs> And, you know, at that point in time, you know, Rebecca had kind of chosen to be like, yeah, I'll, I'll become the princess. And then she decides, no, I just, I want to just go and live with my father. And, you know, Luffy helps her, you know, quote unquote, escape. They would have let her go anyway. And she goes and she goes, of course, to go live with, you know, Kiros. And Viola takes up the, uh, the position as princess. But, you know, Rebecca is like the, her, you know, lady in waiting type thing. And Riku is more than happy to support that. And Riku is more ha more than happy to support Rebecca in regards to wanting to go live with her father and everything, and that she inherited her mother's spirit. And, you know, 
since then, you know, we've seen them at, um, you know, we see them during the Reverie arc and such, and he seems still to be very, you know, very much, you know, protective and, you know, loves his granddaughter and his son-in-law and his daughter, um, of course, and, you know, we'll see what else happens with that. I'm hoping that we'll see Riku again, um, and Kiros again, <sighs> hopefully as, like, allies to the Straw Hats, but we'll see what else happens with that. Uh, next up, we have Lao Chi. Should be this way. One of the two. Lao Chi. I don't know. Uh, however, I make a G. Whatever. Um, and the reason I have him here is because um, you know the Don Quixote family kind of has a little bit of like a family structure. Like Giola, to a degree, kind of acts a little bit like a mother to like the younger kids, to Baby Five and Buffalo and Dellinger and to Law. And Lao Ji kind of, to a degree, acts a little bit like a grandfather to them. And, you know, yeah, he calls Doflamingo young master all the time and everything, even though he's older than him. Um, you know, even though, you know, well, Lao Ji is, of course, older than Doflamingo, and he calls Doflamingo young master out of respect because Doflamingo is more powerful than him, I should say. But he also kind of seems to be, Lao Ji seems to be, like, the closest thing to, like, a grandfather figure that... Baby Five and Buffalo and Dellinger have, and also Law from the time when he was part of the family, um, seems to be the closest thing to a grandparent that they have because, you know, they're all orphans. Um, and during the fight for Dressrosa, um, at one point when Lao Ji is, you know, battling and everything, and Baby Five is there, you know, he kind of, quote unquote, his spirit tries to leave the body, leave his body. And he, you know, his spirit, like, starts to leave his body. And, like, Baby Five's like, no, Lao Ji, come back. Please don't go. And, like, it kind of, like, draws it back in. And, like, we see how much she cares for him. But the flip side of that is Lao Ji seems to have quite a bit of distaste for Baby Five. Because he thought of her. He states this, and it's... I watched the episode recently, and it's disturbing because he says this about a girl he's watched grow up. That she was just nothing but a mere convenience for the Don Quixote family to have. And, you know, that she could be discarded when necessary rather than someone of value. Whether or not that's the way the whole rest of the family looked at her entirely can be left up for debate. But the fact that he says that, with her right there, simply because of the fact of she is going to marry Sai, because this takes place just after, like, Sai, you know, protected Baby Five from, you know, getting hit by his grandfather, and he protected her, and, like, you know, now they're kind of, quote-unquote, engaged, or, you know, there's, like, a little bit more of, like, you know, he's trying to protect her from killing herself, basically, and you know, Lao Ji is just like, why would you stop her from doing that? She's convenient for us. We can find someone else to take up her position if need be. Um, and, you know, this makes Sai extremely angry because he then basically proceeds to uh, beat the crap out of Lao Ji um, <laughs> and uh, win and basically is like, fine, if I win, then I'll, then I'll marry her. Spoiler alert, Sai wins. <laughs> he beats Lao Ji and he, you know, is going to end up marrying uh, Baby Five. Um, and um, I'm going to do a, like, a, a couples for One Piece video series. And one of the couples is, of course, going to be, like, Sai and Baby Five. That's a little bit ways in the series, but I'm going to do that. Um, and I, I break that down a little bit more there. So um, you'll just have to wait for that if you want a little bit more of that. But I do find that very disgusting that Sai or that Lao Ji is just, like, Mm, nah, you're just, you're, you're convenient. You're a convenient thing for us to have and that you can be disposed of if we decide that you have no value. My God. And that's just one of the things that like breaks baby five's heart. Um, next up in that same vein, we of course have Don Chinchow. Uh, who is, of course, the biological grandfather of Sai and Boo, and now the kind of grandfather-in-law of Baby Five. Um, so he is, of course, formerly Don Chin Chow. He is uh, Chin Chow the Drill. Uh, he's a former pirate leader of the Chin Chow family and the Hapu Navy, 
and he, uh, well, he was a 12th leader of the Hopi Navy, and he had a um, 542 million bounty, which is a, a decent bounty. Um, and uh, his relationship with Sai and Boo is, of course, he does have an affectionate relationship with him, uh, with them, but he also is enraged whenever uh, they lose or whatever they show weakness or anything along those lines. Um, <laughs> you know, they're able to kind of calm him down at one point when he thinks that, you know, L Lucy is Luffy, which I mean, like, he's not wrong. Um, but he, you know, he, of course, has the giant knockdown drag out fight with Luffy with, like, Conqueror's hockey on top of it and everything. And we see that. And that's kind of a very uh, interesting fight to watch during the uh, the Coliseum matchups. Um, and later on, uh, when, you know, Sai and Boo get turned into toys first and Jean Chow completely forgot about them. Saying, it was like, I wish I had grandchildren. And then, of course... He gets he gets turned into a toy as well. Um, I don't remember if this is ever explained or if I brought this up before. So when Baby Five turns someone into a toy, the toy, of course, obviously has all of their memories of who they were. Everyone else forgets about the toy. So if you're a toy, and you know you get your mem you know everybody gets their memories wiped from you, and then like your best friend or something gets turned into a toy as well after you did like after they forgot about you will your best friend still have no idea who the frick you are while you're a toy or like will they instantly be like oh i got turned into a toy oh my god i forgot about my friend now i'm a toy anyway now we're both toys okay um i don't remember if that's ever stated or anything i don't think that's the case i think it's just like you just like you're just forgotten about anyway until like it's reversed um but does that mean that the toys forget about the people that get turned into toys after them like do like when sai is a toy does he then forget about boo once boo becomes a toy and like chin chow once chin chow becomes a toy because that would be kind of like a, a like an extension of like horror happening of like oh my god i got turned into a toy oh my god i just forgot someone you know whatever you know whatever happens with that i don't know um but of course jean chow gets extremely angry during the time frame when like sai quote unquote proposes to baby five it's a misunderstanding of course and he's ready to um attack Psy. Again, I go over this a little bit more in the um, uh, Baby Five and Psy Couples video that I'll do. Um, and what ends up happening is, you know, he also like points out, was like, you're already engaged to like the, the leader of the uh, Inhao Navy, you know, his daughter and everything. You're supposed to marry her. Um, the daughter is not very attractive looking. Um, you're supposed to marry her, and Sai's like, I don't care who I marry, I just want to be the leader of the Navy, and, you know, blah, 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 and, like, Sai does, of course, protect Baby Five from Don Chin Chow, and then, of course, Sai then goes and fights, uh, Lao Ji after Don Chin Chow gets attacked by Lao Ji, um, and, of course, uh, later on, you know, Baby Five and Chin Chow seem to get along just fine, um, he seems to be fine with the fact that now that Sai is going to be marrying Baby Five, uh, part of that comes from the fact that, you know, Sai was able to stand up to Chin Chow, and him, his hockey, his will was proved to be stronger than Chin Chow's because when Sai defended Baby Five, Don Chin Chow's, um, you know, drill that he'd gotten back got bent again by Sai, which proved that he was stronger, proved that he would be a great leader of the, the Hapu Navy. And, you know, we see Ching Chow say that to him, and we see him hug his grandson and everything, and he's, he's you know, agrees with the, you know, the marriage between Sai and Baby Five and everything, uh, once that's going to go. And uh, Don Ching Chow and the grandsons, of course, help, you know, defeat, um, the Don Quixote family, and of course, they're at the giant party and everything when Sai becomes a part of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. And he's very, uh, uh, Chin Chao is very supportive of Sai in regards to, um, 
you know, marrying baby five and breaking off the engagement with the other woman. Um, and he's, you know, very happy at the wedding and everything. So, so the next one is, uh, Bartolomeo's grandmother, or so I've been told. I tried to find information about her. I tried to find if it talked about her and like her relations, like Bartolomeo's relationships with people or other things like that. Couldn't find anything. Supposedly it's that, you know, she's his grandmother and she kind of was the one that raised him and raised kind of like raised him to be like this, you know, gangster boss or so that's in, you know, that was in, you know, the East Blue and everything. And she supported him of that. And then, you know, he, you know, she supported him in going off to go and become a pirate and everything. And like, she was kind of the navigator, like back in like wherever it was she lived in the East Blue, like he would call her when they were in the Grand Line and she'd be like, oh, do this. And they would do that and they would somehow eventually got into the New World. <laughs> um, I just kind of, when I picture like Bartolomeo grandmother, I'm like, um, Bartolomeo with like curly gray hair maybe slightly smaller, you know, teeth, the way that he has the teeth, and, like, like an old woman's dress, but, like, a very, like, a cane that, like, the woman would, like, swing around and everything is, like, just the way that I kind of picture Bartolomeo's grandmother. <laughs> um, and we don't know anything else about her. I wanted to find information, but I couldn't. Uh, so, moving on. Uh, next up, we have, um, uh, uh, Grabar, who is, uh, Leo's grandmother. Um, so, uh, Leo is, of course, one of the Tontadas. He later becomes, like, the captain of the Tontada pirates. Um, and, you know, friends Luffy and everything. And his grandmother is, you know, he loves her very much. Uh, and we see this in the fact that, um, he basically stitches her in, you know, because he has a stitch stitch group. He, like, stitches her uh, to like their house so that way she can't fall over or anything like that while there's fighting going on <laughs> so she would be safe i find that adorable um <laughs> leo is adorable and his grandma's adorable too um we really you know we don't see anything else about her we're just introduced to her for the short time when like usopp and uh robin are in Totland. Uh, or in uh Tont or in the tontada on you know in their you know tontada kingdom on green bit and, you know, we see her there. We don't really get to see her, I don't think, afterwards. Um, but I'm assuming she's very proud of, you know, Leo for helping take down the family and saving Princess Moshiri and, like, all that fun stuff. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to really see her again. Next up for grandparents, we have Charlotte, Big Mom, Lin Lin, and Pound. And they are, of course, the grandparents of Capone, Pez, and others. Uh, I say others because um, when we meet Pudding in the manga, and I don't know if she 100% states this in the anime, but in the manga it states that she's like, oh, well, you know, my older siblings, a lot of them are married and have kids of their own. Now, we've met other in-laws, and I go over these a little bit in the... Um, in like the couples videos, some of them are already recorded. Um, in like the couples videos, and I do talk about like you know Aladine and Praline, and um, you know, you know Capone and um, Chiffon and Lola and Gotti, and those are the three that we've met, the three couples that we know of. Putting almost married Sanji, but we don't see any of the other. Um, you know, in-laws or any of the other grandkids, because she said, so like a lot of them have kids of their own, but we haven't seen them yet. So we'll have to see when that comes into play. Um, we may not ever see any more of them. It just depends on whether or not they're like prevalent to the story. Um, although the one I would want to see is, I would want to know if Katakuri is married because I mean, he's, the strongest sweet commander he's you know the second born son he's the one that has conquerors hockey but he's also this one that has you know the the issue with like his mouth and everything that he doesn't want to show that and he doesn't show it to anyone and i just like the idea of there being like he is married and he has a wife and like i mean 
maybe he does care enough about her to have at some point like shown her his mouth and she has no problem with it she was like maybe slightly taken aback by it at first but she's just like that's just who you are and maybe that's the case and like maybe kata curry has a kid but i don't know um, but then again, there's also the flip side of that if he wouldn't want to get married because then that's someone else that he would have to worry about having to be like this perfect person for. Um, but uh, in regards to Pound and and uh, Lin Lin, since this is a grandparents video, um, Lin Lin and Pez, we don't ever really get to see Lin Lin around Pez. The only vague thing that happens is at the wedding or at the tea party for the wedding. Um, Lola or uh, Chiffon is there and she's holding Pez and she's like trying to calm down her mother but that's not working and you know because her mother's insane and you know given the fact that Chiffon has had this abusive relationship with her mother she's probably kept Pez away from her mother which I wouldn't have blamed her in the first place and then when we get to Pound Pez actually kind of sees Pound when Pound shows up to try to protect um, Chiffon and is about to kind of get you know his head sliced off by oven which he doesn't end up dying he just like falls into the water and somehow falls on a tart ship and it floats all the way to dress rosa um but like pez sees pound um and you know later on when we get the cover story for beige's oh my family we do see you know pound of course gets reunited with the daughters uh with chiffon and lola and pez is there and of course, Pez just seems like really happy. It's like, yay, my mom's happy. My, my mom's happy. My dad's happy. I get to meet my aunt. Gotti is now my actual uncle and I have my grandpa. <laughs> um, I guess there's a possibility that like, like maybe Capone's parents might still be around. And maybe at some point, like Chiffon and Capone and like their pirate crews or so will like go to, you know, back to the West Blue, West Blue and like see his parents or something like that which was like his mom and dad just kind of look like variations of, like his dad looks exactly like him and maybe his mom looks you know a, you know looks a little more you know is a pretty or something like that and uh maybe like his parents are just like oh isn't he such a sweet little boy in regards to pez so we'll see what happens with that um next up we have all of the wano grandparents so I think this just kind of reply. I think this only has like two or three here. No, three. There's like three that I talk about here. So first up, we have Tengu Yamahi Tetsu, who is basically, you know, he is the swordsmith uh, in Wano. He's a swordsmith, very renowned swordsmith. Um, he is a descendant of the legendary swordsmith uh, Kotetsu. Um, and he lives with Tama in Amagasa village in the Curry region. And he is basically, for all intents and purposes, Tama's guardian, and he, she kind of refers to him as her grandfather. Uh, we are introduced to him uh, shortly after um, Luffy has arrived on Wano, and she had got, you know, Tama fed Luffy because he, you know, saved her life, and she fed him. And then, you know, Tengu Yama gets extremely angry at Luffy. It's like, you ate the food that was meant for Tama that she only gets, you know, twice a year, her birthday and New Year's. And, you know, you know he gets so angry at Luffy. And then Tama shows up and she's like, no, 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 it's okay. I, he saved me and I wanted to pay him back and everything. And then of course, Tama gets sick because she drank like the poison river water and, you know, she, you know, ate poison food and she gets very, very sick. And Tenguyama is extremely concerned about her because he does very much care for Tama. That is very much obvious. Um, and he explains to Luffy, well, she's sick because of the, the, there's poison in the water and everything. And like there's food around here, but it's all poison. So if you eat it, you get sick. And she's very much, you know, very susceptible to that because she's still such a young kid and she doesn't necessarily have the best immune system. And Luffy ends up, you know, he's like, well, or uh, Tenguyama is like, well, if you take her, there's this there's a like a tea house like this way and if you go that way you'll get to the tea house and they can help and you know Luffy of course takes her and he goes to the tea house and this is when he has you know gets to meet Zoro again and interacts with Hawkins and everything and then of course you know we you know meet uh, Osuru and Kiku and all of that and then we see Tengu Yama again 
um, you know, after um, Tama and Speed were kind of attacked by um, Kaido, they get Tama back to Tengayama and they heal her up. Um, between uh, Chopper and Miyagi, they're able to, you know, heal Tama. And we also find out that uh, Tengayama has this connection to the Kazuki clan, um, that he, um, uh, he is extremely loyal to them, and he spent 20 years uh, patiently waiting for Momo and Hiyori to return, uh, and that he was the one that made um, Ame no Habakiri, and then the... Uh, Yes, he made the, uh, yes, um, he made the Sandai and the Ame no Habakiri. I was trying to remember which one it was. Yeah, he, he made, because it wasn't Enma. I was like, I don't think he made Enma. Um, but he made the uh, Ame no Habakiri and the Sandai Kitetsu. Sandai Kitetsu, of course, was one of Zoro's swords that he had before. Uh, I think he still has it. Um, and he, of course, agrees to allow Zoro to have Enma. Um, because, you know, uh, Hiori gave her permission for Zoro to have Enma. And, um, you know, he was on, like, you know, the, he was, like, this amazing swordsman, probably still is, you know, trying to make these amazing swords that hold the ranks and everything like that. And, you know, he was there when, you know, Ace showed up at the island, you know, four years ago and, you know, befriended Tama and everything and helped, you know, alleviate their famine a bit by giving them their food and everything. And, you know, Tengiyama has been, like, raising Tama. Um, now, there, there's a bit I want to talk about with that, but I want to finish up with a little bit of his history first that we see. Um, of course, he's, you know interacts with Luffy when Luffy first shows up on Wano because he thinks Luffy like took Tama's food but you know Luffy of course protects Tama and you know takes her and gets her medicine and Tengayama is of course you know gives Ami no Habakiri to Zoro and everything um and he still is going to hold on to Enma and no no he gives sorry he gives Zoro Enma why did I say he gave him Ami no Habakiri no he gives Zoro Enma and then he holds on to Ami no Habakiri for now um, probably for like when, uh, you know, <laughs> when, um, <laughs> you know, Momo is old enough, which given the fact that Shinobu, Shinobu just, you know, aged up Momo, um, we'll see what happens with that. Forewarning, I'm recording this like the Wednesday before the next chapter comes out, so I don't know what'll happen in the next chapter, um, for this weekend. Um, so we might see something with this, we might not, I don't know. The last time that we saw Tenguyama, he was currently at the the celebration going on in the flower capital where he had Toko with him. And, you know, Toko, of course, was the adopted daughter of Yasuie. And Tenguyama has, like, taken her under his wing as well, um, given her kind of uh, his protection to keep her safe and everything. And uh, I think Toko and Tama would probably get along fine and Momo and everything. Um... Of course, Hiyori looks at, you know, Toko as, like, a younger sister type figure and everything, as I mentioned in, like, the sister video. Um, Momo got aged up now, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, but the other thing that I did want to mention, uh, but I'm going to do that in a little bit, um, is um, this, you know, the theory that they've done with, like, oh, Tenguyama could be you know, Sukeyaki, you know, Odin's father in disguise. And I will be talking about that, but first I wanted to talk about um, Orochi's grandfather. Uh, so, of course, we have Kurozumi Orochi, um, and, you know, the legacy that he has and everything, he is, you know, current, well, the former Shogun of Wano, he's been decapitated, what, like seven times already? We'll see how that goes. Um, and he, of course... Uh, we find out about his backstory during Odin's backstory. During Odin's flashback, we learn about Orochi's backstory. Now, given the fact that we've already set up with, like, all the horrible things that we've seen Orochi do over the years uh, in regards to what he's done to Wano and to the people and everything, we already hate Orochi at this point in time. We hate Orochi very quickly, very early on. And the backstory gives us where, like, the impetus for why he did this came, where, the, where for the reason he did all this stuff, where that came from. And doesn't change what he did, doesn't make it uh, acceptable or anything like that, but we do get a backstory for him. 
and we find out that he is a descendant of one of the former uh, daimyo of Wano, one of the former daimyo of the different regions uh, of the Kurozumi clan. And um, his grandfather um, had decided that it would be a wise decision to try to poison the other daimyo in order to try to make it that he would be the come that one that would become shogun. And then of course Tsukayake is born and he's the miracle child and you know everybody finds out that oh Kurozumi you know grand you know grand, grandfather Kurozumi or whatever you know old man Kurozumi he's the one that was poisoning all the other daimyo in order to get the throne. So that's when they started doing the Kurozumi hunting which is disturbing and oh my god and they probably could have saved themselves a lot of freaking problem Wano could have saved themselves a lot of freaking problem by just I don't know not doing that not hunting someone just because of what their bloodline is because if there's one thing that One Piece has tried to teach people it's that child children are not responsible for their parents sins that you know you can't transfer a parent's sin to a child that is not the way that the world works and that is exactly what they did with the Kurozumi with the with the Kurozumi clan that they just basically were like oh there's a Kurozumi let's chase them and kill them and he watched his mother get chased and his mother like set him off and kept tried to keep him safe and everything and this is of course when Orochi is a child, he runs into Seni Maru, who is of course the old man, and uh, <laughs> Higurashi, who is the old creepy woman, who is of course, uh, Higurashi has the uh, the Mare Mare no fruit that allows her to, you know, change her appearance, and you know, Seni Maru has the barrier barrier fruit, and you know, Orochi is told this story about like how his grandfather, who were, um, you know their brother i think they're stated that they're like his brother and sister um that the two old the, the two old ones are his brother and sister that uh are uh so those would make uh them uh orochi's um great aunt and uncle um and what ends up happening is like they tell him all this stuff of like you know your your grandfather would have been the shogun and then you would have been the shogun and you know but you know but Sukeyaki was born and you know and all this other stuff that happened and everything and like you know all this you know and they just basically like weave this web and you know in all honesty everything would have been better for Wano if a grandfather Orochi or grandfather Kurozumi just didn't poison all the rest of the daimyo and just like just like stayed out of it uh that would have been better um, or if, you know, they didn't just decide to just be like, oh, let's hunt all of the Kurozumis. That would have solved so many problems. Because this also leads to, of course, Kanjiro. Because, of course, Kanjiro is another descendant of the Kurozumi clan. And he watched his parents get murdered on stage when he was a kid because they were found out to be Kurozumis. And then he runs away. And he is then found by Orochi. And at this point in time, Orochi has already been given his devil fruit, the uh, uh, heavy, heavy no me, Yamato no Orochi, um, uh, you know, to, you know, turn him into the Hydra and everything that he has, you know, that form that allows him to be decapitated multiple times, which is like nice therapy for people, but still, um, he may pop back up again, but he may not, we don't know. Um, and he... he you know, he gives, you know, Conjuro his devil fruit. And then, you know, Conjuro gets, you know, goes and infiltrates Odin. And, you know, all of that happens. And, you know, he's the spy. He's the traitor. He's the one that's, you know, betrayed Odin from the very beginning. And it's just, you know, things would have been better if they just didn't go and hunt the Kurozumi that would have made things so much better and you know Orochi's plan is basically because you know Wano basically betrayed him and his family he's like okay then I'm just gonna basically betray Wano I'm gonna you know sell him out to Kaido I get my you know flower capital and everything beautiful the way that I want 
And I get to know that there are people out there that are starving the way that I had starved when I was a child and, you know, all this other stuff. And of course, you know, uh, Higurashi, you know, takes on, you know, him, you know, Orochi makes his way into uh, Sukeyaki's court and, you know, having, you know, Higurashi, you know, pretend to be Odin to get him in and then pretend to be, um, you know, sent, you know, uh, Sukeyaki as well and you know pretended to be like Sukeyaki is getting ill and you know then proclaims you know Orochi the heir uh, in front of the daimyo so that way they you know take Orochi as the heir because you know Odin's not around and you know they play up this act and everything and of course it's just oh my god you know Things could have gone so much better if in Wano they just understand that. That you don't punish people for the sins of their parents or for the sins of their family. Uh, even, in, even in our world, we still need to learn that to a degree. And our final grandparent that I will be talking about today, minus a few small theories, is Kurozumi Sukeyaki, who is of course the biological grandfather, the paternal grandfather of Momonosuke and Hiyori. Uh, uh, Kazuki. Um, he is, of course, the biological father of Odin. Um, you know, due to Odin's, you know, all of the different, you know, things that Odin has done in his past, Sukeyaki, of course, gets extremely frustrated with him and his out of control nature, and he, of course, exiles Odin from the flower capital and kind of disowns him. And, of course, this leads to Odin, you know, traveling around, gathering up the ones that would become his future scabbards. And he then, you know, Odin, of course, then goes off um, to, well, um, because of the fact that, like, Odin has become the daimyo of Curry and everything at that point in time, um, Sukeyaki um, uh, invites Odin into the flower capital again. And, you know... Odin shows up and he's got like his entourage of like the ones that would become the scabbards and everything plus um uh Izo and everything are there and like you know they've, they've educated themselves they've gotten better you know based on you know what you know Yasui told them to do and everything gave them advice to do and like you know they've gotten so much stronger and better and everything and you know more cultured and that you know representing him as you know the daimyo of curry the way that he should be represented and or, you know, Odin goes in and he talks to his father and the two of them do kind of seem to make up, which is at least nice to see. Um, but of course, during this time frame, you know, Odin, you know, Sukeyaki is being manipulated by Orochi, um, you know, slowly poisoned and everything by Orochi, which is not good. Um, we, the thing is, is that we assume to a degree that Sukeyaki is dead because Odin or, um, Orochi and uh, Higurashi have, you know, played up the act of, you know, oh, they, he's proclaimed, you know, Orochi to be his heir. Um, and we're basically also told that, you know, Sukeyaki never got the chance to meet Momo and Hiyori because, of course, they were both born when Odin was off traveling with uh, Whitebeard. And then when they were with, um, you know, the Roger Pirates and such, um, eventually Odin, of course, did return to, you know, Wano with his wife and children and everything, but that was after Sukeyaki had supposedly died and Orochi was made into Shogun because of their manipulations. And, you know, supposedly Sukeyaki is dead. This is where we get into, like, theory territory. Um, and I'll mention this here. Um, there is a theory, of course, as I said a little bit ago, that Sukeyaki is Tenku Yamahi Tetsu. Uh, we recently just found out Tenku Yamahi Tetsu's age, um, which is, I think he was like 80-something. I don't remember exactly, but I think he was like 80-something. And, you know, we don't know whether or not Sukeyaki is dead or if he, like, somehow survived and escaped Orochi and Higurashi and Senimaru and, like, made his way somewhere, and then he, like, you know, took on the uh, guise of Tengu Yamahu Tetsu. But then, of course, as was also pointed out, Tengu Yamahu Tetsu also existed at the same time that Tsukeyaki did, and unless he was, like, 
you know, having like a double life where like I'm sugar today and then I need a break. So I'm going to go and be like the, um, I got to go be the, uh, this, uh, swords maker guy for a little while. And then I'll come back and be sugar again. Um, I don't think that would have worked. Um, barring the only way that I could see that that shifts is Tengu Yamahutetsu had known Sukeyaki and when Sukeyaki somehow managed to escape Tengu Yamahutetsu like maybe nurse to help nurse him back to health and then possibly you know Tengu Yamahutetsu got extremely sick as well you know with all the poison and everything that's in the water it could have been that he got sick and then you know, as a way of keeping Sukeyaki hidden, he took on the guise of Tengu Yamahitetsu and like Tengu Yamahitetsu died. And then later on, he took in, you know, Otama. Uh, now there is, of course, the theory that Otama is an Orochi, that she is a Kurozumi. And if that's the case, then, you know, A, Tengu Yamahitetsu may not know that. Or if he does know that, he's like, this family has already suffered enough from the crap that we put them through and this child does not deserve to be to suffer for the crimes of like what her father did if Orochi is her father and like he raised Tama or so and you know hopefully Tama and Momo like Tama's loyalty to Momo will be there and will continue um even with him having been you know aged up by you know Shinobu we'll see what happens um uh, Tama, Tama is, of course, very much very helpful right now with her Kibi Donkos. Um, very helpful in regards to the Battle of Monogashima. So we'll see what else happens with that. Um, I think that was about it for what I did. So apparently the noise I heard earlier was not a leaf blower. It was a saw. Um, apparently our neighbor behind us is apparently chopping down a tree and or pruning a tree. And his daughter came by and asked if... That was either bothering me or asked um, <laughs> if uh, that was, uh, if, like any of it fell in our yard, if you could have it. I'm like, that's fine. Um, so, a fun thing there. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, the last thing that I did want to mention was um, I, in regards to Sukeyaki, that is not necessarily theory based, but it's just based on what we've seen. Uh, Sukeyaki, of course, had his. Um, you know, his assistant, uh, I think Bonzaboro was his name, who was um, later on served kind of Odin. And, you know, Odin was, of course, extremely sad when he heard that his father passed away and he regretted not being able to be there on his deathbed. But Bonzaboro continues to be loyal to the uh, Kozumi family and to Toki and to the grandkids and, you know, probably still has told Toki and maybe Odin that your father would have been very proud of you for what you've done here and for, you know, sticking to your guns and everything. He would have missed you and he would have liked to have gotten to see you again, but he would still be proud of you. Um, and he would be very proud of Hiori and Momo and seeing that his, you know, family got bigger, I think. I think that Tsukeyaki would have been one of the grandparents that, like, just, like, spoiled their grandkids. I mean, he was the shogun of, you know, Wano for the, for Christ's sake. If, you know, if Odin and everything, if, like, everything hadn't happened with Kaido and with Orochi, then, you know, Tsukeyaki probably would have just, like, spoiled, you know, Ta you know, Hiori and Momo Rotten in regards to, like, you know, affection and gifts and just like oh my god they're so cute I love them and everything he probably would have just done that which as on my mom's side of the family I'm the youngest grandchild of a lot and like I have I have cousins on my mom's side that are like old enough to almost be my parents um and so there's there's a large age gap uh between me and my oldest cousin um and I'm the youngest and you know, my grandfather and my mom said unfortunately died long before most of us grandkids were born, but my grandma lived to see all of us grandkids be born, and she was around until I was like 22-ish, I want to say 22, 23-ish. Um, and, you know, so she got to see all of us grow up, she got to see a bunch of the, grand, the great grandkids and everything like that, and, you know, 
she she kind of spoiled me to a degree because I was the baby grandkid, the baby granddaughter, and the daughter, the baby daughter of her baby girl. Um, because my mom is the youngest daughter. She has two younger brothers, but she's the youngest daughter. And I mean, like, my grandma adored all of the grandkids. There's no denying that in the slightest. She adored all of us grandkids. And, you know, she she loved getting to spoil us whenever she could. Um, and, you know, uh, in regards to some, some trivia about my grandfather on my, uh, on my, or my grandparents on my dad's side of the family, I found out, well, A, I've mentioned before that my grandfather on my father's side is a pastor, and he has now been a pastor for, I think, like 60, I want to say like 66 years or so at this point in time, because last year I think it was his like 65th anniversary for his ordination, uh, which is still saying a lot. And uh, I also found out that my grandfather used to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> um, and he, he did that like this was after he was married, after he had kids, way after he was ordained. He drove a motorcycle for a while. And then eventually he, he got into like an accident. Nothing bad happened, but he did get into an accident. And he just so was like, I'm not going to ride the motorcycle anymore. It's like, I found that out. I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> that was fun. Um, but yeah, and my my grandfather is uh, turning 90 this year. So yeah, um, you know, happy 90th birthday to my grandfather. Uh, you know, my, my grandmother on my mom's side would have been, I want to say she would have been, if she was still alive, she would have been over a hundred. Uh, uh, I want to say she would have been like maybe 102 or 103 this year. She was still alive. Um, but she, uh, she passed away, unfortunately, um, uh, several years ago. Um, unfortunately, my grandmother on my father's side passed away several years ago as well. Um, but, you know, uh, grandparents are something I think that people should hold on to a little bit more than we tend to. Um, you know, they're, they're very important things to have. Um, uh, my grandparents have always been very supportive of me, and I thank them for that. And, like, the same thing for, like, my parents in regards to like the, the the Mother's and Father's Day videos that I did and like the Sister's Day video uh, in regards to like my relationship with my sister. So um, I don't know. I was debating on if I wanted to find that like Aunt's Day or Uncle's Day, but I'm like, there's really not that much to work with with that for like One Piece in regards to like aunts or uncles or stuff like that. I mean, like with the with the Charlotte family, there's a lot of aunts and uncles there, but there wasn't really that many other like aunts or uncles that I could go off of um, to get a video out of. Um, but I'm like, I went over the major ones, parents, grandparents, siblings. I think I'm good. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do, like what anime I'm going to focus on next year for like parents and siblings and stuff like that for next year. Um, I did one piece this year, obviously. Maybe I'll do like My Hero next year or something like that, but we'll see. Um, I did also, um, as I mentioned, I am going to do a series where I do, um, the different, uh, couples in one piece where I talk about like, you know, the, the various either married couples or whatever the case is for couples that we've seen in one piece. I am sticking to canon couples in this, in the videos. I'm not going to do fan couples as much as I like those. I might do those at a different point in time, but as much as I like certain fan couples, I'm, I'm. I did my best to stick to the canon couples. So like Usopp's parents and, you know, you know, you know, Scarlet and Kuros and like, you know, the, you know, like Baby Five and Psy and stuff like that. I tried to do my best to stick to the canon couples. Or if like the couple is technically not canon, I explain why I wanted to talk about them in the video. Uh, like I did do a video about like that I called like the horror of love where I talked about um, uh, like uh, Hogback and Shindri and like Absalom and um, Lola, Zombie Lola, where I talked about those ones um, because I wanted to show like the twisted side of love too, um, which given the fact that um, we're getting closer to Halloween, we'll see where that lands compared to Halloween. But um, that's what we have for that. So uh I thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I apologize for all the cuts between allergies and 
person was saw on tree. I thank you very much for watching though and I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. And remember to tell your grandparents happy grandparents day for those of them that are still around. So bye. I have no sympathy for criminals, but for family I do.